In a multiple slaying at a sorority house, a single bite mark is the only evidence. Can detectives use it to build a case against the most notorious serial killer of all time? Investigators hunt for a sexual sadist in a Canadian resort town. He leaves behind a trail of victims, but few clues. Can they stop him before he strikes again? Someone's murdering men on Florida's highways. A bloody palm print suggests a woman's touch. But who is she? What prompts some intelligent people to become cunning killing machines? As forensics tries to break their chain of death, psychologists seek to understand serial killers' fatal compulsion. February night in Pensacola, Florida in 1978, police officer David Lee saw an orange Volkswagen leaving the parking lot of a closed restaurant. Because the car had no reason to be there, he ran a check on the tags. He discovered it was stolen. The driver tried to flee the scene. After a chase and a struggle, he was apprehended. Police found stolen credit cards and several fake IDs in the car. The driver was taken in for questioning. The man flashed a student ID, but police determined that it too was stolen. After two days in custody, he finally decided to tell police his real name, Theodore Robert Bundy. At first, the Pensacola police had no reaction. They had no idea who Ted Bundy was. But they'd soon find out that his name had just been added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. He was suspected of killing three dozen young women in at least four Western states. His lackluster arrest in Florida was the beginning of the end for the most notorious serial killer in history, who may have murdered over 40 women in 16 years. Ultimately, forensics would tie him to his crimes. In the process, the study of his murders would help spawn a whole new field of forensic psychology, a science that tries to understand how serial killers are created and what we can do to stop them. William Hagmeyer of the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit in Quantico, Virginia, interviewed Bundy in prison. He was probably the most efficient killing machine that we've seen amongst the serial murderers that we've studied. Uh, with his ability to articulate how he made certain choices, why he let certain people live and die, he's become a standard by which other serial killers are measured. So enormous were Bundy's crimes that they defied traditional crime-solving tactics. It wasn't until after he was caught that the pieces began to come together. Bundy didn't know that Florida would be the last stop on his trail of death. He arrived on January 7, 1978, after escaping from a Colorado prison where he was awaiting trial for murder. He rolled into Tallahassee and moved into a boarding house called The Oaks near Florida State University. It's now a fraternity house. Bundy didn't kill randomly. He was methodical selecting college-age women with dark, straight hair parted in the middle. His proximity to campus provided ample quarry. Within a week of his arrival, he resumed his deadly rampage. At the Chi Omega house, sorority sister Nita Neary returned from a date around 3 a.m. on January 15, 1978. The lock to the back door had been broken for weeks. As she entered the house, she heard a commotion upstairs, someone running. 
she stopped as she saw a man run down the steps and disappear into the night. Then she realized someone was hurt. At 3.15 a.m., the campus police answered a frantic and garbled call for help from the sorority house. Bill Taylor was one of the first officers to respond. We were stopped and broke up a fight between two of our fraternities, and we were just clearing that call when uh, we got a call that two girls were in a fight at the Chi Omega house at 661 West Jefferson Street. The campus police thought this was just another routine call. But nothing could prepare them for what they found. The house mother told the officers two women had been attacked. After calling paramedics, police investigated the rest of the house. An officer found Margaret Bowman in her bed. She'd been bludgeoned, then choked to death with a stocking. Down the hall lay another woman. Like Margaret Bowman, Lisa Levy had been sexually assaulted, then beaten. In his fury, the killer had left bite marks in her flesh. She died en route to the hospital. While paramedics tended to the injured, police tried to make sense of the scene. Officer Taylor had never witnessed anything so brutal. You're thinking all kinds of different things when you're going through there and just how in the world could somebody do what was done to those victims in that manner uh, while they slept in their beds. The women never saw their attacker. But Nita Neary, who escaped a similar fate by mere seconds, described him. He was of medium height, wearing a navy pea coat and a knit cap. He carried a club. The sketchy description provided little help. The killer left behind no evidence, not even a fingerprint. At Florida State University, almost every man became a suspect. Every woman lived in terror. We knew we were looking for a white male. We knew we were looking for someone who was around 5'8", five, 5'10". Five, we knew that he had a dark colored kind of peacoat kind of jacket on with a uh, one of those navy blue uh, watch caps on. You were looking at everybody that was walking or everybody that you could see. Did he match that? Uh, where could he be now? You know, is he hurting somebody else now? You get that horrible feeling that there's, that there's more, that something else is going to happen. Are there other crime scenes? Are there other people that are injured, other people hurt that we don't know about yet? By then, Bundy had already moved 100 miles west to Lake City, Florida. There, he changed his tack and pursued a different kind of prey. Yeah, he's just in the back there. Yeah. He lured 12-year-old Kimberly Leach into his van. Yeah, he's right in the back. They drove off. Uh, Leach would be Bundy's last victim. After ditching the stolen van and killing the girl, he stole a Volkswagen. He was partial to them because the passenger seat could be removed to accommodate his victims. But before he could strike again, he was picked up by Pensacola police for driving a stolen vehicle. Bundy's past was catching up with him, courtesy of the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Florida police were almost certain he was responsible for the Chi Omega murders, but they had to gather evidence to prove it. Uh, or seven, if, if this is a bicuspid, uh, to the, the right. only clues but, collected at the Chi uh, Omega murders were the bite marks on the body of Lisa Levy. Well, Investigators the hoped they would be enough. It's, it's high in the, arch. the task the of analyzing them fell on forensic odontologist uh, Richard Suveron.
uh, when Bundy was arrested. And the bite mark evidence uh, was not considered a high priority. Uh, but when the detectives in the case were unable to come up with anything else, such as blood, fingerprints, uh, hair, fiber, anything like that, uh, then they decided, well, we'll give this a try. At the time, bite mark evidence had not been used in Florida courts, but investigators had no alternative. Fortunately, one of the bites left a deep impression. Dr. Suveron saw that the killer's teeth had distinctive characteristics. They were crooked, chipped in several places, and had an unusual configuration. But he needed an impression of Bundy's teeth to make a match. That required a search warrant based on probable cause that Bundy's teeth were similar to the killer's. A snapshot of Bundy showing his teeth convinced a judge to sign the warrant. Suveron could now take the impression of Bundy's teeth. From the impression, Suveron made casts. It was apparent that Bundy's teeth were very unusual. Bundy's teeth uh, are unique. That uh, I've never seen a set of teeth like Bundy's, and indeed, uh, no one in the world has a set of teeth like Bundy's. Turned and bit a second time, and here's the lateral. And Most the striking were Bundy's lower teeth, which but showed an unusual pattern of wear, here. along with a distinct layout. How the, how the, the top teeth were chipped. Both sides, and the teeth fit. Using acetate overlays of Bundy's bite pattern. Suveron was able to conclude that only Ted Bundy's teeth could have left the bite marks found on the body of Lisa Levy. Drop in. Especially with that eccentric bite of his, that's, that's pretty compelling. Based in large part on this forensic evidence, a Florida grand jury indicted Bundy on July 27, 1978, for the two Chi Omega murders. His indictment was read on live television. Let's go. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged, indictment, two counts burglary in the, uh, two counts murder in the first degree, three counts attempted murder in the first degree. My chance to talk to the press. Contrary to section 78204 Florida statute. I'll plead not guilty right now. And your grand jurors. Bundy, always wanting to be in control, enjoyed the attention and turned his trial into a media circus. Well, listen, I've been kept in isolation for six months. I've been kept away from the press. I've been buried by you. You've been talking for six months. I think it's my turn now. All right? We got a court order that you There won't be any press interviews. Sure there won't be any press interviews. You've given them out. I'm, I'm gagged. You're not. Okay. The Captain right. Ryder will read your I'll be heard. Emphatically denying his guilt, acting as his own attorney, Bundy was convicted of the Chi Omega murders as well as the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. Ted Bundy was caught in large part because he was a terrible driver and an alert police officer in Pensacola picked him up. He was convicted in large part because of forensic odontology. He rarely left any forensic evidence at his crime scenes because he knew what the police were looking for. He didn't know that the science of forensic odontology advanced to the point where uh, a forensic odontologist can testify with tremendous accuracy that bite marks on a victim, as with Ted Bundy, match Ted Bundy's teeth. He didn't know that. As Bundy sat on Florida's death row, he began to trade information in order to postpone his execution date. He confessed to a string of murders throughout the West and provided details about how he committed them. He painted a graphic picture of the evolution and slow deterioration of a serial killer. To, to become a serial killer is to become a serial tennis player, a serial jogger. When you get away from it for a while, you start getting the itch to get back. He said the itch was getting tremendous. The clock was ticking. Experts suspect Bundy may have started killing in 1962 at age 15. Then, beginning in 1974, he killed eight college women in and around Seattle. On crutches, or with his arm in a sling, he used his seductive charm to lure his victims. In this way, 
he snared six women in six months. Ted Bundy felt that this victim had a choice. She didn't have to come with me. And as he said on many occasions, I wasn't a caveman killer. I didn't go and drag them out. You know, they came to me. Emboldened by his success, he sought more risky prey during a crowded weekend at Lake Sammamish State Park near Seattle. Two of the women at the lake that day, 23-year-old Janice Ott and 18-year-old Denise Noslin, apparently left with the injured stranger four hours apart. It was the last time anyone saw them alive. Based on eyewitness descriptions, police artists made a composite sketch of the slender young man with a Canadian accent who called himself Ted. Part of Bundy's success was his cunning. Part was his looks and outward behavior. No one could have suspected his homicidal inclinations. Seattle writer Ann Rule has made a career studying killers and their victims. In 1975, when she was just starting out, she was hired to write a book about the Seattle killer. Little did she realize that he would turn out to be someone she knew. And I thought, gee, that looks like Ted Bundy. And um, I know that, that Ted sometimes affects the Canadian dialect. Uh, I knew that he lived in a, in a boarding house on the same street where two victims had been found. But they were looking for people with a criminal record. And Ted Bundy, all, the only thing they had him for were two citations for bravery, for helping, helping citizens. He'd been assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Council, worked for the governor of Washington, not the kind of guy you're going to focus on. Anne had met Bundy in 1971, four years earlier, when she volunteered at a crisis clinic in Seattle. I was a civilian volunteer, and they would always pair us with a work-study student. And just through the luck of the draw, my partner was this very nice young man who was then about 23, uh, named Theodore Bundy. So I spent two nights a week for a year locked up alone all night long with Ted Bundy. The weekend following the abductions, the beaches at Lake Sammamish were strangely empty. Over the next several months, bodies of women who disappeared began turning up in the nearby hills. Police in Washington intensified their search for the killer. Twelve women had gone missing in the Seattle area, all suspected to be victims of the mysterious Ted. But Bundy was smart enough to know when to move on. In September 1974, he made his way to Salt Lake City. Over the next month and a half, three teenage girls disappeared without a trace. Then, on November 8th, Bundy spotted 23-year-old Carol Duranch. Posing as a police detective, he approached her and told her that someone had been caught stealing something from her car. He asked her to look inside to see if anything was missing. She told him everything seemed to be there, but Bundy asked her to accompany him to police headquarters to see if she could ID the thief anyway. Though Durant was skeptical, she did as he asked. But as soon as she got into his Volkswagen, the trap was sprung. He handcuffed her and threatened to kill her on the spot. But she managed to get the car door open. She broke free. Durant was the only woman that we know for sure to escape the clutches of Ted Bundy. But Bundy was unfazed. Over the next several months, more women would die. In Utah, Bundy was finally caught on a traffic infraction. Carol Durant picked him out of a lineup. He was convicted of kidnapping and sentenced to one to 15 years. He was then extradited to Colorado, where, based on hair samples found in his car, he was charged with the murder of a young woman. And there, through a small hole in the ceiling of his prison cell, he escaped to kill again. 
Eight days before the Chi Omega murders, Ted Bundy fled Colorado and headed to Florida. A friend loaned him money to live on. He'd been incarcerated over a year, and his fatal compulsion grew all the while. This need to fill the addiction had grown so strong because he'd been in prison and unable to kill, but sitting there fueling his fantasies, thinking about it. And um, when he was out, he had no control over it. Bundy was now taking chances, making mistakes. Gone was the kindly stranger ploy. At the Chi Omega house, he attacked with violence and rage and left behind the clue that led to his conviction. Bill Hagmeyer believes that Bundy's recklessness was inevitable. Serial killers become more daring and less predictable over time. Many serial killers, in fact, all that I've dealt with, uh, their, their crimes start out as personal agendas, so to speak. Uh, the first victim may be an accident, it may be a displaced aggression, but after that, it becomes predatory. Once he was in prison, Bundy provided the ultimate case study in serial killings. Hagmeyer set to work trying to understand where a killer's fatal compulsion stems from. Bundy himself helped interview other serial killers on death row to find a common denominator. The answer isn't clear cut. In background and behavior, serial killers are just like the rest of us. Serial killers come from different backgrounds. Um, there is no consistent factor that I'm aware of in all their development. Uh, basically, if one were to look at Ted Bundy's um, evolution as a human being, um, they would be shocked that he became a serial killer because he didn't act any differently, uh, didn't appear to be maturing any differently than other children around him. Writer Ann Rule believes that killers like Bundy are born and bred. I think to create a serial killer or any sadistic sociopath, you have to have a combination of a genetic predisposition toward violence. Just like some people can play the violin, uh, some people can tap dance, but these people have a tendency toward violence. Now, if that child is born into a loving home where he feels safe or she feels safe, we'll never know. But if you have the terrible synchronicity of the pre genetic predisposition and ab an abusive home, then you have the perfect soil to grow one of these people. Bundy showed his homicidal tendencies as a young child of three. His Aunt Julia, who was then a teenager, awoke to find Ted slipping butcher knives into her bed. But as with most serial killers, it came down to a matter of choices. We're all a product of our environment, our genetics, uh, our experiences, and what we become in life, whether it's a career choice, uh, making a choice of a mate, uh, or our avocation, and his just happened to be murder, uh, we're accountable for that. Bundy discovered in his early 20s that he was illegitimate. He aspired to a higher station than his stepfather could afford, becoming active in local politics. But rejection by a college girl of breeding and refinement may have filled him with smoldering rage. When he began killing less than a year later, all of his victims would bear a resemblance to the girl who'd rejected him. As Agent Hagmeyer spent more time with him, Bundy began to call him his best friend. Bundy shared what it's like to be a serial killer. He said, when you're alone with a victim, who's very much alive and vibrant and pleading for their life, he said, he said, you become God. He said, you have the power over life and death. And he said, when you kill them, you hear the last noises that they'll ever put out of their mouth. You can basically taste the last breath that comes out of their body. And he said, there's a phenomenal feeling of power over that. And he said, that, that's what you feed off of after a while. It was like, coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien 
and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible. Bundy was convicted of killing three women and confessed to killing more than 30 others. Police will never know if that was a boast or a conservative estimate. He received his final punishment on January 24, 1989, in Florida's electric chair. Hungry for that sense of godlike power, serial killers feel compelled to murder. But they don't always kill their victims. Sometimes they marry them. On June 29, 1991, two canoeists were spending a lazy afternoon on Lake Gibson near Niagara Falls, Canada. The waters had receded, revealing several blocks of concrete speckled with black paint. When one of the men stepped on a block, it broke in two. He was horrified at what he saw. Inside were the severed limbs of a human body. Police found body parts in each of the eight blocks. It took two weeks to obtain the dental records to identify the victim. She was a teenage girl named Leslie Mahaffey, who disappeared two weeks earlier from the nearby city of Burlington. Whoever killed her had also sexually abused her. It was a shocking crime in a country unused to violence. Placed in charge of the investigation was Vince Bevan of the Niagara Regional Police. Once we knew who the victim was, we had you know, almost a month's lag time in there, so we had to go back and start to retrace to find out uh, you know, who she was with, what the circumstances were of her disappearance, and start to work back from the city of Burlington to see if we could find any, uh, any clues uh, that would point us in the right direction about how she met her death and ultimately wound up in the concrete in Lake Gibson. But there were no witnesses and no clues to the killer's identity. Forensic scientist Mike Kershaw began by looking at the concrete blocks, gingerly sifting through the rubble, hoping to find some piece of helpful evidence. I examined approximately 700 pounds of concrete and just the examination using the light sources I spent probably uh, close to 120 hours on. Some of the things we were hoping to find uh, included items that might have come from Leslie Mahaffey, like jewelry. Uh, we were also looking for evidence such as uh, um, saws or saw blades. Uh, but what I've been finding is uh, hair, fiber, um, hair that doesn't look or looks foreign to the concrete itself or foreign to uh, uh, Leslie Mahaffey. Chemical analysis determined that the concrete was a ready mix brand so common it was impossible to trace. The paint was a black spray paint. The trace evidence consisted of hair that matched the victim and several strands of different light colored hair. Kershaw had nothing to compare it with. The forensic evidence was not adding up to much. The search for the Niagara killer took on a new urgency when another young girl named Kristen French was reported missing. She left her school on April 16th and was last seen walking past a church. She never arrived home. Two weeks after Kristen French disappeared, a scrap collector discovered her body. She'd been sexually abused and killed in much the same fashion as Mahaffey. For Vince Bevan, it was now clear a serial killer was at work, and his increasing boldness was cause for alarm. Kristen French had been abducted at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in a parking lot near a busy street. For somebody to abduct her from that particular area, uh, it's unusual because of the high level of risk that that offender would have taken. I mean, there are any number of, of things that could have happened to, uh, to interfere with what his plan was. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's not a desperate act by any means, but it is certainly uh, 
an above normal level of risk for an offender of this type. The first break in the case came from 75 miles away in the town of Scarborough. For two years, police there worked unsuccessfully to catch a serial rapist. Acting on a tip, in 1990, they'd visited Paul Bernardo, an accountant who resembled the man described by some of the victims. He seemed an unlikely suspect. When you think of somebody who could be responsible for crimes like this, you expect them to be marked in some way, you know, like a hunchback dragging one leg behind him. As a matter of procedure, police collected blood and saliva samples from Bernardo for DNA testing. He was one of 1,500 potential suspects. And in these early days of DNA testing, the process was time consuming. It took an overworked Canadian forensics lab two years to complete their analysis of Bernardo's DNA. Meantime, Bernardo moved from Scarborough to Niagara in 1991. The serial rapes in Scarborough had suddenly stopped. The killings in Niagara had begun. When the DNA results came back in February 1993, they proved Bernardo was the Scarborough rapist. Scarborough authorities notified Niagara police. We could have had an opportunity to connect those offenses um, earlier in the investigation. But as it was, that connection wasn't made until the DNA probe came back with Bernardo. Bernardo was arrested for the rapes in Scarborough and the murders in Niagara. He denied the murder charges, and police had no sure way to connect him to the killings. If Bevan wanted a conviction, he needed tangible proof. He obtained a warrant to search Bernardo's house. A search team spent 10 weeks looking for hair, blood, fingerprints, any physical evidence showing the presence of the murder victims. They got in their hands and knees with a stereo microscope and searched tough by tough until they found, started to find hair. Then they actually found small um, clippings of hair that were unique to Christian French. Along with the hair, police found traces of DNA from French and Mahaffey. Autopsies revealed that both victims had been drugged. In a desk drawer, investigators found a tranquilizer that Bernardo's wife, Carla Homolka, had obtained from the veterinarian's office where she worked. On a videotape Bernardo made for insurance purposes, police found an inventory of his basement. More clues came into focus. First was a circular saw, one that matched the type police thought he may have used to dismember his first victim. The next clue on the tape was equally incriminating. And as he panned across the basement floor, um, showing some of the tools that he had, um, he, he went past an open cupboard. And in the top shelf of this cupboard were two cans of spray paint. One had a gray, gray lid, one had a black lid. When we went in and executed the search warrant and during our search, um, we were unable, unable to find that black can of spray paint. Besides the evidence on the tape, investigators noticed gouges on the stairs to his basement. Microscopic examination revealed black paint marks. Forensics experts created concrete blocks similar in size to the ones that contained Mahaffey's body. They spray painted the blocks and pushed them up a similar flight of stairs. The marks they made matched those on Bernardo's stairs. The forensic evidence was piling up, but it was all circumstantial. The case was clinched with the help of a surprising eyewitness. In January 1993, Paul Bernardo's wife, Carla Homolka, left him. She would later tell police that Bernardo had tied her and forced her to act out the last moments of his victims' lives. Fearing she would suffer their fate, she fled. In February, as evidence was mounting against Bernardo, she decided to make a deal and confessed that she herself had played a role in the heinous crimes of Paul Bernardo, crimes that he had videotaped. Carla Homolka had met Paul Bernardo in 1987 
when she was still a teenager. Bernardo was a handsome, apparently successful young man six years older than she was. But beneath his pleasant exterior, Bernardo was possessed by a desire to subjugate women. Roy Hazelwood, a former FBI agent and an expert on sex-related crimes, has spent six years studying the strange bond between serial killers and the women who fall in love with them. Canadian prosecutors called on him to assess Carla's state of mind. Hazelwood believes Bernardo, like many serial killers, saw women as lesser creatures that didn't deserve respectability. That explains why they go for nice middle-class women rather than prostitutes or alcoholics or drug abusers, because they want to tear down that image of uh, niceness and purity, if you will, that surrounds a nice middle-class person. As a teenager, he began spying on women in the dark. They became objects that existed only for his pleasure. According to Hazelwood, Bernardo saw his future wife, Carla Homolka, as a woman he knew he could dominate, forcing her to his will. These men have an innate ability to identify women who are vulnerable, women who are naive, women who have few life experiences or low self-esteem, or they have, as I mentioned earlier, dependent personalities uh, where they crave and need the attention of others and the approval of others. Carla's parents encouraged her romance with the handsome upscale Bernardo. By 1990, he already had her under a horrible spell. On Christmas Eve, she helped him drug her own sister, Tammy, so he could have sex with her. But the drug had induced her death instead. They said she drank too much alcohol. No one suspected the truth. There's no question that uh, Bernardo had manipulated her. Um, she's, she was uh, an attractive, intelligent young woman. Why she ever became involved in the first incident is sort of a mystery to me. But I think it's quite clear that after her sister's death, she was trapped. She had trapped herself, in essence, in a situation that he could take advantage of. On the night of June 14, 1991, six months after Tammy's death, Bernardo went out to stalk young women. According to what he told Carla, he saw Leslie Mahaffey locked out of her house at 2 a.m. He offered his assistance, then lured the girl to his car with the offer of a cigarette. Carla told police Paul had forced her to videotape his sexual assaults on Mahaffey. Paul and Carla were married two weeks later. The day police discovered the body sealed in concrete. Over time, Bernardo had tightened his grasp on Carla, drawing her deeper into his crimes. Because she's in love with him, and because she wants his approval, and uh, because she wants to please him, she agrees to participate, and eventually it becomes more and more bizarre. Carla helped her husband kidnap Kristen French in April 1992. She'd pretended to need directions, asking the girl to show them where they were on a map. Bernardo sneaked up behind her and shoved her into the car. Once again, according to Hamulka, she had participated in and recorded Bernardo's sexual assaults on video. But where were the tapes? Despite 10 weeks of searching every corner and crevice of Bernardo's house, Canadian police were unable to find them. They'd discover later that Bernardo, in jail, had his lawyer remove them. When the tapes were finally turned over to the police, they validated every shocking detail of what Carla had said. Bernardo used the tapes to experience his crimes again and again. The videotapes, along with Carla Homolka's testimony, were more than enough to convict Paul Bernardo. 
he was sentenced to life in prison, no chance of parole. For her part in the crimes, Carla Homolka was sentenced to 12 years in prison, a sentence based on her testimony prior to finding the videotapes. But the tapes clearly showed Carla participating in the torture and sexual abuse of the victims. Was Carla truly a victim herself or a savvy accomplice who worked out a sweet deal with the police? Is she a victim? Not in the sense that she's not responsible for what she did. She certainly is responsible for what she did. Uh, and she needs to be punished for her activities uh, in which she acted in concert in the abduction and or murder of three different people. So in that sense, no, she's not a victim. Is she a victim in the sense that uh, she came under his spell? Is she a victim in the sense that, uh, that he abused her? In that sense, yes, she's a victim in that sense. From the first of Paul Bernardo's rapes to the day of his capture, almost six years had gone by. According to Ann Rule, if he hadn't been caught, he would have continued to kill. They start maybe two or three years apart, and then it's one a year, and then it's one a month, and then it's one a week, until toward the end, they need more and more of the substance that they crave to make them feel normal. And in, in the case of serial killers, it's murder. First they do it to get a high, and then after that, they seem to need it. And, and they're almost all caught because they, they begin to take chances in the end. Slowly, painfully, experts are learning the warped rules of the sexual serial killer. But do the same rules apply when the killer is a woman? In December 1989, along a Florida highway outside of Daytona Beach, officers found an abandoned car registered to a Tampa man named Richard Mallory. He had been missing for several days. Another week and a half went by before the 51-year-old Mallory turned up, naked, shot several times with a 22 caliber pistol, and abandoned two miles from where his vehicle was found. Police sealed off the area to search for clues. Investigator Larry Horzepa of the Volusia County Sheriff's Office led the investigation. At the time, we weren't exactly sure what we had, so as in all of our uh, homicide investigations that we do, we did an entire sweep of the area and basically collected up everything uh, that we could possibly find that we thought may be connected with the crime. But investigators found very little evidence pointing to the killer. The investigation was stymied by lack of clues. As Volusia police worked on the case, police in three other counties struggled with murders of their own. Immersed in their local crime scenes, they had no knowledge of the other killings, no idea they were connected. We didn't know about the other killings uh, that had been occurring for almost a year. Uh, basically, we were uh, operating solely on ours. As the body count climbed, police became aware that a deadly pattern was developing throughout Florida. Finally, the separate police departments pooled their resources. And we found the similarities in the fact that all the men were older men, uh, being over the ages of uh, 45 years of age, uh, that they were basically all traveling alone, uh, that they were traveling the major highways. Uh, we found that the bodies, all of them, were discarded close to a major highway, and the fact that the vehicles that they had were placed somewhere else. The killer had been methodical, consistent, all but one of the victims had been shot in the torso with a 22 caliber pistol, a relatively small firearm. In every case, the driver's seat was pulled up close to the steering wheel. The evidence suggested the killer was a short person, possibly a woman. If this were true, it was one for the books. There'd never been a female serial killer, or at least not one that police knew of. But at this point, it was just a guess. The killer had been thorough, 
wiping off all fingerprints. Then, on July 4, 1990, a woman reported to police that she saw a car crash through a fence, then drive off. In the car were two women, a blonde and a shorter brunette. A few miles away, a car matching the description was found abandoned. Witnesses at this scene also described the two women. The car's registration revealed that it belonged to Peter Sims, age 65, an itinerant missionary who'd been missing for almost a month. Police saw a possible connection to the string of homicides. The car was turned over to Merv Stevens of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The vehicle had been basically wiped down on the inside and outside. The uh, crime scene analysts had went to the armrest on the driver's side of the car and had removed the armrest. Upon removing that armrest, they noticed what it looked to be, appear to be a palm print, a bloody palm print. The single print was their only clue, and a potentially damning one. But prints in blood are notoriously fragile. Forensics would have only one chance to read the imprint. Only one chance to link killer with crime scene. They could not afford to make a mistake. I think they made the latent lift as a last resort. Um, once they had discovered what they thought was a blood print or looked to be like a blood print, it was reddish brown in color. And in photographing it and using the different lighting techniques, a blood print will tend to dry out. Once the blood print dries out, it becomes real fragile. And simple moving it around, handling that, that type of item, the print will basically deteriorate and it will fall to pieces. After the print was photographed, clear tape was carefully placed over it. With even greater care, the tape was slowly lifted. Any little bend in the tape would crack the print and compromise the lift. Once the print adhered to the tape, it was affixed to a white card. The technicians were home free. The lift was a success. They analyzed the palm print and compared it to those of known criminals in the state of Florida. Stevens found a match in a woman named Lori Grody. She'd been convicted on a weapons charge. Grody was also known as Cami Green and Eileen Warness. Because several of the missing automobiles had been burglarized, police began checking pawn shops in the hopes of finding the stolen goods. At one, they found a pawn ticket in the name of Cami Green for a particular brand of camera and a radar detector, items missing from the car of murder victim Richard Mallory. Florida requires pawn shops to take fingerprints. Cami Green's print from the pawn ticket was compared to the prints in Stevens' files. The prints matched. The bloody palm print and stolen items were now linked to a single person, a woman named Eileen Warness. Investigators traced Warness to Daytona Beach, where she was a part of the biker crowd. She hung out at a bar called The Last Resort, where she slept on these benches behind the bar. Undercover police kept her under constant surveillance until they could collect more evidence of her crimes. But when they learned that a statewide biker barbecue was scheduled for the next weekend, they were afraid they'd lose Warness in the crowd. On January 9, 1991, police made their move and arrested her. A key found in her possession led police to a locker filled with items stolen from the murder victims. The case against Warnes grew stronger. Next, they pressured her friends for more information. To keep them out of it, Warnes confessed. And then I thought to myself, oh, I might as well just keep on shooting. Because I got to kill the guy. If he's going to, he's going to you know, go and tell somebody. When she was convicted in Florida for the murder of six men, 
Warnus had the distinction of being one of the first female serial killers, deadly as the male. But why, beginning in December of 1989, had she become a killer, hitching rides with middle-aged men, suggesting sex for money in a secluded spot, then shooting them to death? Warnus claimed she'd acted in self-defense. It was a claim Larry Horzepa found difficult to believe. I think as she was applying her trade, as she was going along, for whatever reason, whether she needed more money or whether she decided that this would just be easy pickings, um, at one point in her life, starting with Mr. Mallory, she decided to bring a firearm into play. And once she went ahead and fired that first shot and killed that first man, felt it was easy. And why not do it again? Ann Rule has studied women who kill. She disagrees that robbery was the motive. She believes Eileen Warnes felt abused by the men in her life, and the killing was her attempt at retaliation. Her anger was typical of serial killers. But of all the women that I have ever studied, she is the only one who seems to have a particular victim type, who has a particular M.O., who's killing stranger to stranger, and fits into the serial murder pattern. For Anne Rule, the most chilling aspect of serial killers is their lack of remorse for their crimes. These people believe that they deserve to have anything they want that makes them feel better. It doesn't matter who gets hurt as long as they're happy because they are real and the rest of us are paper doll characters. We don't feel the way they do. With each murder, serial killers lose a little more of their conscience, making the next killing that much easier. As police departments throughout the country begin to share information, they can more quickly see the deadly patterns emerge. Then they can stop serial killers in their tracks.